it's you authenticity just... and experimentation because mm -hmm. play right. is the opposite of perfection, right? And perfection is rooted in shame, ego, and constantly trying to be right. This yeah. is why it's so exhausting for so many people to go to work because they feel like they have to pretend to be somebody else. Yeah. Do managers know your languages of appreciation? Do they know their staff's languages of appreciation? Oh, is it gifts? You could actually take someone's bonus that they get at the end of the year, you spread that out over the course of the year and give little bonuses here and there, more productive. Uh, Steven Johnson says the future's where people are having the most fun. The organizations that people wanna be a part of are the ones that are playing the most. Hey, what's up, Masters? Welcome to another episode of Path to Mastery. And today we are with Mr. Jeff Harry. What's going on, Jeff Harry? What's up, David? Happy birthday, man. I'm excited. Let's do this. Thank you, sir. How did you get two first names, man? <laughs> I don't know. My dad is Caribbean, you know, yeah. and he went with the Harry. He was maybe he was going to call me Nigel. So I could have been gone with Nigel Harry. Nice. So I have three first names, Jeffrey Christopher Harry. So. Oh, my gosh. Good for you, man. That's awesome. All right. Nice. You got the good look going, too, with the shaved head glasses. This is a, a <laughs> I mean, I'm just stealing from you, David. I'm just stealing it all from you. All right, good. Well, I heard you in Clubhouse uh, last weekend and your message super resonated. Uh, the play thing, as well as uh, the inner critic in, in that, that little hack you had, I thought was one of the best ever DM'd you. And here we are. So I appreciate you uh, you popping on today. And Absolutely, man. I'm, I'm ready to play. Let's go. Right, cool. A little bit about you. I'll read your bio. Uh, Jeff Harry combines positive psychology and play to help teams, organizations create uh, psychologically safe workplaces through play and assist individuals in addressing their biggest challenges through embracing a play oriented approach to work. Some of the topics he covers includes how to deal with toxic toxicity in the workplace, how to address office politics, how to play with your inner critic, which is uh, honest, you know, like I said, that really triggered something with me, you know, that little voice, uh, how to help your staff uh, rediscover their flow, how to navigate these uncertain times through play. His work, uh, for his work, Jeff was selected by um, Bamboo HR Engagely as one of the top 100 HR influencers of 2020. Congratulations. His work has most recently been featured in New York Times, Mashable, Upworthy and oh man, Shudenland. What is that? Shondaland. Yeah, Shondaland. Shondaland. All right. Awesome. Well, hey, man, appreciate you uh, doing this. We're also, um, we were recording into Clubhouse. We're recording into Clubhouse. I just popped out for some reason, but we'll, uh, we'll anyway go back in. And that's the least of my issues right now. So, hey, man, thanks for joining us. Absolutely, man. Um, all right. That said, let's start off with play, man. Uh, Play in the workplace, flow. You know, why? Why, why is that so? Where, what, what has happened with play in the workplace, and why is that so important? So sure. So here, let me first define play. So play is um, any joyful act where you forget about time. You know, where you are mm. fully in the moment, where there is no purpose, there is no result. You don't have anxiety about the future. You don't have regrets about the past. You are just fully in flow. And why is it important in the workplace? When staff are in flow, they're 500% more productive. Mm. On top of that, they also want to be there when they're doing their zone of genius or their ikigai. They're more likely, turnover is less, morale is boosted, productivity is boosted, all of these benefits. And then on top of that, you know, uh, Stephen Johnson says the future is where people are having the most fun. The organizations that people want to be a part of are the ones that are playing the most. That's why TikTok was so popular last year. You know, Netflix, Clubhouse, the reason why Clubhouse was so popular. Mm. You know, people gravitate where fun is happening, right? Even if you look at um, Amazon back in 1999, the reason why it was so attractive to work for Jeff Bezos when he was paying nothing was because he was tackling the most interesting issues in the tech space at that moment in time. So we have to be aware of that, as well as the idea that now people are going back to the office 
a lot of people are thinking about whether they even want to go back to the office. Eighty yeah. percent of people are saying right now that they don't want to go back to the office full time. So what are you doing as a leader to persuade people or incentivize people to come back to the office? How is it more enjoyable and more productive for them to be there? Because they've been at their house and been pretty productive at home. So you have to figure out how am I bringing more play and fun into the workplace just to keep the staff that I have, especially Gen Zers. Mm. So let me ask, well, a couple of things popped up from that. So one, flow, you mentioned flow. Mm-hmm. When I hear flow, well, I don't know. You tell me what what does flow mean? I, I think of it so, as being so. Present. Flow is, yeah. you know, so in positive psychology, uh, Dr. Chikset Mihai um, identified what flow was, and really, what is actually happening when you are in flow is your prefrontal cortex, a part of it is actually shutting down. Your inner critic is shutting down. And you felt this way sometimes when you play sports and you can't like hear that inner critic because you have to make decisions so quickly, right? So a prefrontal cortex, a part of it actually shuts down and you go through something called hypnofrontinality. Um, and then all of a sudden you get this shot of dopamine and you become highly creative, highly curious, and you start to see all of the options that are in front of you. Mm. And actually also time slows down. And we felt this when we are in flow doing our work, right? And you're seeing all of these opportunities that are possible. You felt this when you've traveled and you're like saying yes and to everything and all these opportunities pop up. So when you're in flow, that's when you're doing your best work. That's when you can answer questions you couldn't answer before, right? A lot of tech heads actually, I think some of them like even get high so that they can get into a flow state mm-hmm. sometimes to create the next great, you know, uh, invention that they have, right? Um, and then on top of that, Google Google did this thing called the 20% uh, rule back then, where they actually gave their staff a fifth of their time to pursue their curiosity, to pursue their flow. And what came of the Google, Google 20% program? AdSense, which pays the bills, Gmail, which everyone uses, Google Meet, all of these foundational products that now Google sits on because they gave their staff the ability to get follow their curiosity, play, and get into flow. So what? So you mentioned play. I mean, obviously, plays a way. Can can some people? Could someone be in flow without play? Just being focused on what they're doing. I almost and- see play and, and flow as synonymous. I, okay. I I consider play, flow, and zone of genius right? As the same thing as your ikigai, the same thing. Got it. Because okay. Gay Hendricks talks a lot about how people have their zone of incompetence, things they suck at, zone of competence, things they're average at, zone of excellence. This is where most people get paid is they things they're really good at, but they don't really care to do it either way, right? Mm. Then there's zone of genius. That is the work where if you weren't getting paid to do this work, you would still do it. You know, it's the work where you forget about time. And the more you can get your staff to do their zone of genius work, the more just the more productive and the more they're going to push the envelope so that your company can be more successful. That's where all that's where all the innovation is in the zone of genius. I want to talk a little bit about zone of genius. How does somebody know? You know, it's funny when you look at my uh, clubhouse, we you know, you mentioned clubhouse. When you look at my profiles is my genius is uh, is is uh, is audio. But it's also curiosity. How, mm-hmm. how does somebody figure out what their, their, their zone of genius is? They figure it out by if I asked you, what would you be, what would you do at your job? Even if I didn't pay you to do it. What's that work? Oh, well, mm-hmm. you know, actually nothing. You know, I need to get paid to do all of my work. So then you're not doing your zone of genius. We got to identify what your zone of genius is. What is what is one of the most enjoyable things that you do? I talk to managers all the time and I'm like, what's your staff's zone of genius? I don't know. Why don't you ask them? What is the thing they love to do most at this job? Oh, I love to talk to clients. Okay, what percentage of time does your staff currently talk to clients or this specific person talk to clients? Uh, they're only talking to them like 15, 20% of like their week. Wait a minute, but that's their zone of genius. You know, how do we increase that from 20 to 30%? Because if you do that, not only 
Are they going to be more productive? They're going to bring in more money for you doing the work they love to do most. And they're probably going to stay longer. They'll work past the 40 hours Mm. because they love to do the work. We forget about that all the time, constantly trying to like micromanage people when you simply need to focus on figuring out their ikigai and their zone of genius, and you're going to get the most out of them. Yeah. Like for me, like I am horrible with like doing administrative work, paper, right. you know, but there's like, people that you. thrive on that, right? Like right. A, a, an executive assistant, like they're in a zone of genius. But for me, that's like torture. Right. That's- so if you double down on the thing that you love to do, what do you love to do? Uh, I, I love talking to people. I love, you know, just being in conversation, prospecting, uh, doing this. Right. So, so if you're like, if like my zone talking, of genius, I love talking, man. Right. So <laughs> my zone of genius is prospecting and talking to people. So everyone help me do more of that because that's mm. going to bring us more money and take all of these organizational things, the tax stuff, you know, the, you know, the invoicing, all that stuff out of my way so that I can do my, my genius because that is how we're going to be most successful. And when everyone's doing that and you have a psychologically safe team where everyone's doing their zone of genius, that's when everything's operating on all cylinders. That's when you, you've seen that with teams when they're like in their flow, man, like they're, you know, when the Bulls are playing or the Celtics are, you know, when MJ was playing and you just saw the team, everyone was doing their thing, right? You yeah. know, Randy Brown was playing defense. MJ is, you know, scoring. Steve Kerr's in the corner. Like, you know, like everyone's and they're doing not their thinking thing. about it. Right. They're just they're not thinking just, like Jordan's not thinking about. No, it's it just it's just naturally happening. It's just natural. And, the, and then what happens? Everything slows down. The basket gets huge. Right. So mm. this happens with us at work where we're like, oh yeah, that is the next innovation. A lot of times we brainstorm by going into like a box room, sitting at a box table and being like, all right, let's brainstorm and be creative. Why? Let's think outside the box. You just put yourself in a box. Why would you do that? Like, this is not a creative way to answer problems. Mm. So we have to rethink how we're actually doing work. So Jeff, I want to jump into the inner critic in a minute. Um, yeah. And I'm excited about that conversation. I, we got a few people listening in on Clubhouse. Thanks for joining us on Clubhouse, by the way. Awesome. Hey, listen, we're going to talk about a huge, important topic now, the inner critic. We all have one. It's that little voice in there. Uh, Jeff is a master at, at this conversation. So I would invite a few more people into the room. If you can, you're going to be doing them a favor and a gift. It's a gift. Uh, before you answer that, get there. I'd like to give a couple examples, though, of work, like uh, play in the workplace. Can you give us a few that people can implement right away? People well, listening first, to this? The, first, the one is identifying your staff, right? Like identifying their zone of genius and their ikigai. What's the thing that they love to do most? Mm-hmm. Another way in which you could bring play in the workplace is meetings, right? Well, first off, don't waste time with meetings. Like if their meeting is not necessary, it doesn't need to be an hour, make it seven minutes. But if you could, you could actually positively prime the meeting by the first person that actually speaks at a meeting primes the entire meeting. And this is before the meeting even starts. So let's say some people hop on Zoom and someone starts talking about their baby and they start talking about like, you know, good things that are happening. You know, that actually makes the meeting more productive. If people start by complaining before the meeting starts, changes the whole vibe. Another way in which you could play in the workplace, do managers know your languages of appreciation? Do they know their staff's languages of appreciation? Oh, is it gifts? You could actually take someone's bonus that they get at the end of the year. You spread that out over the course of the year and give little bonuses here and there, more productive. Is it acts of service? Take on some of their work, let them go home on a Friday early. It's a quality time, actually meet with them quarterly to talk about like their future or have lunch with them, right? Is it um, words of affirmation? identify not only giving them praise when they're in their department, but outside of the department, because studies have found as well, when you're recognizing someone's words of it, when you're recognizing how good they are, then they start working even harder because they realize how good they're doing. So these are all like small tweaks. This is not like, hey, let's bust out ping pong tables and do this because I'm not talking about that. There are a lot of people that have slides and ping pong tables 
No plays happening in those places. It's not a psychologically safe place, even though play is, you know, that you have all these things around you. Play isn't actually making it a safe place for someone to show up authentically and be willing to speak their mind. And you can even do this when you're at a meeting and you're like, hey, you know, is there a topic you feel uncomfortable sharing? And see what they have to say. And if they don't feel comfortable sharing at the meeting, have them come up to you afterwards. Start playing in those ways Mm. and experimenting in those ways. And then giving, and one last one, giving your staff a different way of tackling a problem. Hey, we always market in this one way, right? I want us to take on this new project and I want a brand new way in which we're approaching it. And I'm going to give you free reign to do it. And I'm going to let you fail and be okay with it. I am giving you a chance to experiment in all these different ways. When you're actually doing that and following through with action, then people are like, all right, I'm willing to play now. I love it. Sounds like a, a, an environment of uh, a lot of authenticity and just everybody. I, I'm trying to think of the best. Yeah, it's, it's, well, just, it's, it's authenticity just... and experimentation because Mm-mm. play right. is the opposite of perfection, right? And perfection is rooted in shame, ego, and constantly trying to be right. This yeah. is why it's so exhausting for so many people to go to work because they feel like they have to pretend to be somebody else. Yes. But when you're playing and you're pursuing your curiosity and experimenting, like I think I mentioned this on Clubhouse last time, I had a colleague that worked or a former colleague that worked with the Mars Rover. Her main goal was to fail on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. Her job was to cause that Mars Rover to fail as many times as possible. We need to be walking into the workplace willing to embrace failure, willing to embrace curiosity so that we can actually create the next great invention. You know, interesting. I'm thinking about that person that you just mentioned. If they, their job is to, it, it, uh, they're in their genius thinking about all the negative things that can happen. But yet for someone like me, that would just exhaust me. Right, right? exactly. So we yeah. have to figure out what people's strengths are. And that's what the manager's job is, right? Is to is move around those pieces. The manager's job is not to micromanage. It's not to tell people like, you need to do this work and make sure you get it done by this certain period of time. And you can do that, but that's not going to make them more productive. Mm. That's just going to make you really annoying. So your job is to identify how does this person's strengths connect with this person's strengths so that we can make a really strong team and like kick ass at work. I love it. Let's talk about the inner critic now. Sure. Um, and yeah, I, you had, you had talked about naming your inner critic, mm. uh, Gargamel. <laughs> and, uh, I thought that was amazing. I, I instantly, I thought about it and I came up with, with my name, which is Boudreaux. <laughs> Boudreaux. 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 Gargamel. Cause of yeah. problems. So what, what, t- let's talk about the inner critic first. Like what, what, I mean, for people listening that may not, I'm guessing everybody I mean, everyone knows it, but I mean, let's break it down, right? So first off, let's understand that you have your rational mind and you have your intuition. These are separate parts of your brain. Your rational mind's main goal is to keep you alive. That's it. It's just designed to, you know, for survival. And I think what's problematic is we go to our rational mind to help us answer a lot of questions, which we shouldn't be going to that. We should be asking our intuition. So a lot of times we're like, hey, should I take that risk? Should I do this side business? Should I, to, you know, should I, you know, reach out to my boss, you know, and, and suggest trying this new way of innovating? You know, your rational mind always is going to be like, no. Don't take a risk, play small, Mm. stop doing. And we need to stop leaning on our rational mind because it's our intuition where all creativity is, right? So what is your inner critic? Your inner critic is that mean voice in your head that is constantly whispering to you and trying to protect you from all the trauma you experienced way back when, from third grade to your first job to high school, all of that stuff, right? And you know your inner critic has been there for a while because you feel like crap. You don't even realize it's been there for like an hour. So you're maybe you're binge watching Netflix or you're eating a burger. And then you just like, I feel horrible about myself. Why? Because that inner critic has, critic has been whispering to you this entire time. So here is a strategy to actually address your inner critic, because this is all about self-awareness, right? So the next time you feel like crap, I want you to stop, you know, 
And if you have a piece of paper and a pen, write it down. Or if you have your phone, put it on your phone. But I want you to start listening to what that inner critic is saying to you. And it's going to say stuff like, you're a loser. You know, this is why this is why you're so fat. This is why, you know, no one loves you. This is why your business is going to fail. Like, just write all of the things down. And the reason why you're doing this is you're trying to practice recognizing this mean voice that's in your head, right? And as soon as you first write it down, just that alone is really powerful because you start to see those patterns and you start to recognize, is that my voice? And then you ask yourself, who is speaking? Like, what is, who's the person telling me I'm a loser? So you start to think about what does this person look like? What does this character sound like? And I use the word character on purpose because what you're trying to do is you're trying to separate it from you. It's a voice from the past. It's some trauma person. Yeah. It could be like some bully from third grade. It could be your aunt and uncle that's shooting on you. It could be that first horrible boss. It could be a combination of all of them. It could be a cartoon character. In my case, as, as you know, David has tell, said earlier, mine is Gargamel. Gargamel's main job is to suck the life force and the joy out of everything that I'm doing. So Gargamel is always telling me, Jeff, you're full of BS. You know, you're going to be broke. You're doing well right now, but you're not going to do well later. You know, no one loves you. And then what I can do, because I've now identified that Gargamel is a separate entity from me, right? It's just trauma filled third grade voice in my head. I can turn to Gargamel and be like, actually, Gargamel, I'm doing really well. Actually, I'm surrounded mm. by people that love me. Actually, my business is doing phenomenal. Look at that. I'm even talking to David right now. Like, you know, like things are doing well. I'm doing well, man. Like, you know, and when you say that to that inner critic, you're not saying it with anger and you're not trying to quiet it because never try to quiet your inner critic because it gets louder the more you try to silence it. But the more you are able to acknowledge it, that is super powerful because then all of a sudden it's like, you're like, oh, thank you for warning me. I appreciate that. Um, but that is a worry that actually is not relevant anymore. I don't really need, I'm, I'm not worried about that. The other thing you can do, and I don't think I mentioned this on Clubhouse, is you can also, another great way is you can actually text your friends when Boudreaux shows up. So you could be like, yo, Boudreaux just showed up. <laughs> and you tell your friends not That's to respond. Awesome. But you just say, hey, Boudreaux showed up and Boudreaux said this. And as soon as you say that, it quiets. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Again, it quiets. And then the final thing, and this is the supercharge, the inner, the um, you know, this inner critic like play, right? Is then you look back at that list of all the mean things that that Boudreaux said, right? Or whoever it is, Gargamel, and you flip them. So you go. I'm going to be broke. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be extremely successful and quite wealthy. Um, no one loves me. I'm surrounded by people that love me. Um, uh, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have, I'm very confident of the things that I can do at work, right? And you start to flip those into a list. And then that list, you start repeating that list back to you. That becomes a mantra that you can say each time your inner critic shows up. And what you're doing is now you're giving strength to your inner child, that powerful cheerleader voice, the one that usually whispers like, you got this, the one that whispers all of those innovative ideas that change your life. And then when you give that power, all of a sudden that inner child is like, yo, we can do anything because we're not listening to that inner critic anymore. And, and again, this is about, I was just talking to someone on another podcast about, don't focus on time management. This is energy management. This is this, I like Elizabeth Gilbert says this a lot. She, her full-time job is working on her mental health. And then she writes on the side, even though she's an author, the mental health part, the mindset part is the, is the one that makes you more successful to address mm. the critic. So we are, we are actually recording a podcast on Path to Mastery, but I do have it streaming into Clubhouse. So uh, a couple of my favorite people are actually in the room listening. Uh, let's go. Yeah. So I was just curious to see if, if N Nate Nathaniel uh, has a question he wants to ask, man. Do you have a, you have a question you want to ask Jeff Harry? Hey, I, I am not uh, up to date on who Jeff Harry is. It sounds amazing. I love the, the talk about the inner critic and how changing your words to uh, the opposite of what Boudreaux uh, comes out and tells you, uh, I love that. And uh, I do that quite often now. I didn't used to, but I, I love that. And um, 
just here to listen and see if I can, uh, if I come up with some any que- with some questions, I'll definitely ask for sure. All right, brother. Well, we appreciate you. Uh, if anybody else wants to come up, just raise your hand. I'll bring you up. If you have a question for Jeff, we are going to be wrapping up in, in, in pretty quickly, maybe five to 10 minutes max. So uh, yeah, if you have a question, raise your hand. Otherwise, I appreciate you being here. And this this is being recorded and will be out on iTunes and, and all the rest of the podcast sites. So I appreciate Jeff for being here. Awesome. All right. So uh, that said, I have, I have just one more question for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's going to be a lot of people that are going to listen to this, Jeff, and they, they're going to know they have an inner critic and, and, you know, if, like I named mine right away. Right. Like I said, okay. I knew, I knew it knew it. Well, it took me five it minutes, it took right. me five minutes. And I thought of years ago, I did a talk and I, and I shared the story of this Boudreaux guy. And then I sh- there was like a, a 10 minute story. And then at the end, who was Boudreaux? It was me as a little right. kid. Right. You know, so that, that was when I transitioned. But um, the people that are listening that that know they should go create a, a voice or, or a, a, a identity for them, the inner critic, wh- why aren't they going to do it? Like they know they should do it, but they don't. What, what, why do people do that? Uh, because they're scared, which is totally understandable because there's a fear there's a fear of success there. As much as there's a fear of failure, there's a fear of like, actually might, because think about what your inner critic also helps you do. It helps you stay small. It helps you not take that next risk. It helps you like, you know, be like, hey, instead of me pursuing the thing that I've always wanted to pursue, let me just binge watch one more season of whatever show I'm watching, right? So it helps you in that way to like stay like mini, right? But and, and we have to also realize that you have multiple inner critics. As I was running a workshop once and someone was like, I have a board of directors of inner critics. Yeah. Like you have, you have Boudreaux, but then there are some deeper ones each level, right? But that inner critic is, is what is preventing you actually from getting to that zone of genius. That is the, per, that is, it's preventing you from being your full self. So the more we're actually able to give that love and attention, right? And not, and not like, Listen, what is it? Um, Viola Davis talks about how you either claim who you are or you end up chasing your worth for the rest of your life. How Mm. many people do you know chasing their worth? Why are they chasing their worth? Because they listen to their inner critic, right? They hop on Instagram and they compare themselves to everyone else. Instead of hopping on Instagram, you can still do social media, but you, instead of hopping on Instagram, creating some really great content and then getting off of it because it's, you you know, or doing the same thing on LinkedIn, we start comparing ourselves because that's what we like to do. But because that's what the inner critic wants. The inner critic wants you to feel small. It wants to, it wants you to remain like, like you're in, you're 13 or 14 years old. But the more we're able to give it love and be like, hey, we, I want to create something amazing. But I can't create something amazing, Boudreaux, until you get quiet and I can listen to, you know, my inner superhero over here that's constantly trying to tell me about the next innovation I need to be doing in the world. So can you just calm down for a little bit so that we can do our thing? So, well, I don't know that Boudreaux is ever going to go away, though. I he's, he's not. I, he's not but right. About, it's going to be like beautiful mind, right? He's just going to get slightly quieter. He's just going to move a little bit further to the back. I, yeah. The, but the more, so the more you give it love, the more that it's just going to like, it's just going to be a whisper because mm-hmm. right now it's super, like for most people, it's super loud. And then the worst part about it is we think the inner critic is us. We think that mean voice is us. So instead of saying like, Boudreaux is telling me that I'm horrible or I'm lazy, I believe I'm lazy. And that's dangerous. When you start saying, whatever comes after I am determines everything, Yeah. right? So we have to be really conscious of the words we're actually using, not just the ones coming out of our mouth, but the ones we're saying in our head. So I ask everybody for a question. I apologize. I didn't get to your question sooner, but the question is, um, why do adults stop playing and how do they get back? How do they get back to the play? Sure. So adults stop playing because of 148,000 no's. And what I mean by that is studies have found that by the time you reach the age of 18, you've heard the word no 148,000 times, which contributes to your inner critic, right? Then you go to school where you're asked to raise your hand, ask for permission all the time. So then you're shut on as well there. Then you're shut on by adults that are telling you 
you should become a doctor. You should become a lawyer. And you're like, I'm five years old. Why are you giving me all this advice? I don't even I'm going to remember it. Right. <laughs> and then you get to your, then you get to your teen years, especially teenagers now and social media, we get inundated with more information in a day than most people got in the 1950s in an entire year. And what is all that information telling you? You're not enough. You need to start buying more products because that will fill the void in your heart. And, and one thing you should never do is don't play. Don't be yourself. Don't be your weird, nerdy, strange self. So all of society is telling you not to play, right? And be rebellious. That yet when you, David, are willing to be like, I'm going to start this podcast, right? I'm going to create two clubhouse rooms. Like when you start experimenting like that, everyone's like, don't, don't do that. Your inner critic saying that, everyone's saying that, like, does there an ROI? Why are you doing it? Is, you know, mm. you should just be constantly, constantly making money and not doing this podcast. And you're like, no. I want to do this because this serves my creativity. This serves my zone of genius and my flow. And it actually opens all these other doors for me. So you are, play is such a rebellious revolutionary act. So then the question of how do we actually play more, my challenge to people is you need to get bored. And what do I mean by that is that means First, you need to identify what calms you down, what soothes you, because you can't play in an anxiety-ridden state or an angry state or a sad state. So identify what actually calms you. Oh, I take showers, um, you know, and I have a flood of ideas. Oh, I go on a walk and I have great ideas. I dance in my house and I have great ideas. Like what soothes you? And then what I mean by get bored is stop binge watching Netflix, stop looking at social media, stop responding to every email and just get quiet, Right. And when you actually get quiet, all of a sudden you can hear that inner child, that inner superhero, because remember the inner critic super loud. The inner child is super quiet. It's whispery. It whispers stuff like you got this. It whispers stuff like mm. start that podcast, start that real estate club, you know, like that it, it's, you can barely hear it. So you have to get quiet enough and get bored enough. And think about it when you were a kid, that's when you had your most mischievous ideas, right? And then once those mischievous ideas pop up, you pursue one of them. And it doesn't matter if you achieve success from pursuing that or not. It's the idea of you taking a risk and now sitting in that uncertainty and being like, oh my gosh, I can change my entire life by simply making this one decision, right? You're, all, you're just one risk away all the time from changing everything. So we need to be experimenting in that. And that's how you can play more. Dude, fantastic. How do people get in touch with you? What's the best way? Uh, best way is rediscoveryourplay.com and simply click on the let's play button. And I have a bunch of like play activities to like figure out more about how you can tap into your zone of genius. And then you can hop on a call with me and we can figure out how you can kick ass more in this world by playing more. I may have to hop on a call with you, man. Oh, that's, that's awesome. So this, this episode, we're going to, we're going to get this to the front of the line, probably be out in two to three weeks. So hey. you are, by the way, if you're in a clubhouse room, we're room starting to get some people, which is cool. We are, we are recording a podcast live. So we have Mr. Jeff Harry with us and Jeff is a master with, uh, at play as well as the inner critic. And again, the best way to reach Jeff, if you liked what he said today is, well, rediscover yeah, your play rediscover com. your play uh, dot com and uh, and you can connect with him that way so again just want to say dude appreciate you awesome same as last saturday when i heard you um what's the one thing you want to leave everybody with like the, the, what do you want them the, the people that listened people that are listening right now if they're going to take one thing from, from listening to us for the last 35 minutes, what do you want it to be? Yeah, man. Okay. So let's go there, man. Let's do this. This is for, this is for David on his birthday, by the way, people yeah, baby. My celebrate gonna kill me too. <laughs> so, yo, I love to tell people, um, I like to goodwill hunt people at the end. Right. Um, and what I mean by that is anyone that has seen the movie, goodwill hunting knows that Matt Damon in that movie was the genius and Ben Affleck was not, but they were best friends. And at the end of the movie, they're at a construction site and Ben turns to him and he's like, yo, when are you going to take one of these high paying jobs? Because he can be a millionaire. Right. Mm. And Matt's like, I'm not, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to work construction right next to you. And we're going to raise our kids next to each other. And we're going to take them to Foley Field. And that's just what we're going to do. And Ben turns to him and he goes, 
look, if I see you here in 20 years, I'm going to kill you. Like, I'm literally going to kill you. And Matt's like, what are you talking about, dude? And he's like, I'm going to be here in freaking 20 years. But you are sitting on a winning lottery ticket and you're too scared to cash that in. And for all of your listeners, everyone that's currently in Clubhouse, right now you're sitting on a freaking lottery ticket. And maybe you've cashed in a little bit of it. Right. But I'm talking about the thing that you're scared to do. And the reason why you need to do this is not for you. This is not about you. This is not about you cashing in for yourself. This is about the idea that somebody is waiting for you to do your thing so they can do their thing. You know, your child is waiting for you to do your thing. A brother, you know, somebody in your life, some someone that you mentor, like they are waiting for you to kill it, to, to, to do the next amazing risk-taking zone of genius play so that that gives them permission to have the bravery to do theirs. So, you know, if you want to change the world, we talk all the time about having this huge impact on the world, simply doing the thing that makes you come most alive can because it will have this ripple effect. So my question to you is, are you ready to show up? Are you ready to do the thing that makes you come most alive? And are you ready to cash in on that winning lottery ticket? Because the world needs that right now. They need you to take that risk and to actually allow yourself to play more. Dude, that's, that's it, man. Mic drop. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you. Thanks so much, man. Have an amazing rest of your week. Celebrate, sir. Yes, sir.